God reminded me that significance, security, serenity, the things that mankind chases after, really can never be found in so many of the programs that we see advertised today. I was briefly just going through different kinds of self-help books and self-help seminars and I realized a lot of them had to do with the concept that is getting more and more popular these days. It's the concept of wellness, W-E-L-L-N-E-S-S. That we're all seeking for wellness. There are wellness spas. There are wellness seminars. There are different kinds of deep breathing exercises. There are different kinds of gym classes that, that encourage you to do various things physically, mentally, emotionally. There are different kinds of, of programs that the world is trying to offer to us because they know we are all seeking for something to quieten that, that sense of either emptiness or meaninglessness or unease in our lives. And the Lord has been reminding me that really, really at the end of it all, He is the source of all these three things that we look. As I've noted in the quest for meaning in life, which has often been likened to a search for significance, security, and serenity, we have often looked to the things, the thoughts, and the trends of this world. We look to the things, the thoughts, and the trends of this world. Can I have the next slide, please? Yeah. Because somehow we, we feel this emptiness deep within. And sometimes we think that in order to feel better, we must do something to address that need. I know ladies who go out shopping, whenever they feel miserable. Some have a change of hairstyle. I don't know, men also go out and do things they don't normally do in order to get distracted, in order that they might feel better. So there are various things that we want to, to buy. There are various thought patterns we try to change. There are various trends we try to follow. But you know, church, they don't really feel that emptiness that came when man and God got separated in the Garden of Eden because man decided to look for his own security, to look for his own sense of significance and to find peace or serenity on his own. When God first made man, we were significant because we understood we were made in His image. We were secure because we realized that God had put us in the garden and even before he had made man, he made everything that man required. By the way, God hasn't changed. Before God allows you to go through any situation in life, he has already set all things in place that you might be able to find him and trust him. I will always remember this thought that was brought to me so clearly when I was listening to someone share about a, a medical condition, a serious medical condition, which she had suddenly been informed of by the doctor. And as I was beginning to feel sorry for her, and I, I said, you know, you must be very shocked and surprised. Her response to me was, yeah, I, I was a little bit stunned when I heard that. But you know, she said, at that moment in time, the Holy Spirit told me, I am caught by surprise, but God is never caught by surprise. There is nothing that ever happens to me, Pastor Stephen, that God already doesn't know about. Mankind was secure in knowing that God's love for them was such that He had already made the Garden of Eden complete with everything that mankind needed. Then He created man. They found significance in being loved by God. And of course, the serenity of the garden was such that the Bible says in the cool of the evening, the Lord came down and spoke to them. But when Satan came, Satan began to plant doubts in the heart of man. That it was not God, that God was actually a limitation to the security, a limitation to their desire for success. 
And you know, that's what prevents a lot of our loved ones and a lot of our friends from really wanting to surrender themselves to the Lord. Have you heard this said when you ask a friend whether they wanted to accept Jesus, uh, whether they wanted to be a Christian? They, they kind of say, no la, uh, good la, but not, not now la. There are still things I haven't experienced yet la. When I retire la. It's like, after I become a Christian, cannot do this, no. Cannot do that, no. Cannot do that, no. Cannot do that, no. It's like God is a damper on life rather than giving abundant life. And this morning, I'm just going to remind myself and all of us that actually, God is not a great big wet towel. God is the cause for celebration. God is the cause of great rejoicing in every one of our lives. God is very, very mindful. God knows that we, in our quest for these three things, so often turn to the things that we see, which we think are tangible. If I want to be secure, I need a good job. I'm not negating the fact that a good job is important. If I want to find significance, I've got to really make a name for myself. Again, I'm not saying that significance is not important. It is. God built, inbuilt that need in us because it is really, as it were, one of the, the aspects of dignity that we find ourselves, we, we, we long for some dignity in our lives. That's why there's that quest for significance. And dignity is something that's important to God. And you know, friends, we can actually dignify each other by really respecting each other and understanding that all of us are made in the image of God. The quest for security, for significance, for serenity. We try so hard to find these things in this world. The Bible refutes this kind of thinking. And the Bible declares that true joy and satisfaction comes from a relationship with God. And note this. It is a conviction that God's will for us is governed by three things. God's wisdom, God's love, and God's grace. God's wisdom, God's love, and God's grace. Which is why I am very grateful always for that constant reminder that the important thing for all of us in our lives is to find God's will and to do it and to obey it. Because that really is the source of all that I ever need. Through his disciples, Jesus reminded all of us of these, these truths. In, in John's letter to a church, a young church, John the Apostle in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 to 17 said this, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. John was just contrasting between the transient and the permanent between life now and eternity, and, and eternity. John fully understands that in this world, there is this craving. There's this craving that every single one of us seems to, to have a natural desire for things. That, that we, we seem to have that desire to be accepted, to be loved. So many times sexual sin is a result of an unfulfilled need. That young girls give themselves to somebody they don't even really love simply because there's such a need to feel accepted and wanted, only to regret it after that. 
Sadly, some young men go on their sexual escapades just to prove to themselves and to others that they are men who are manly, who can conquer. So many times we find ourselves involved with different kinds of activities just to satisfy our need for authority or praise from different people. But John tells us, hey, these needs may be satisfied for the time being, but they pass away. Because in the long run, that concept of wellness and that concept of well-being that you're looking for will never really be found in earthly thoughts, earthly things. Neither will they be found in earthly trends. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 to 3, and then verse 15, Paul writes to the Colossian church and says this. He says, you know, since you have been raised with Christ, set your heart on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above and not not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Let the peace of God rule in your heart, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Again, it's a whole series of attitudes. Paul is saying if you're looking for these things in your life, think of the right things. And let your heart be moved by the right things. And the end result will be peace and thankfulness and gratitude. I know a lot of us may be thinking right now, Pastor Stephen, easier said than done, isn't it? Aren't you making us too, too heavenly minded? And too, this, this is such an idealistic kind of a sermon. I'm not saying this because I'm saying it. It's because the Word of God does say it. And I have thankfully also experience this in my life. We all have earthly needs. We all very often want to respond to the challenges and the things that happen to us using wisdom that we have amassed as we have grown up or planning strategies. God has given us a brain but I pray that your mind is not just a mind that is an educated mind but a mind that is a sanctified mind, the mind of Jesus Christ. And I pray that the ambitions that we have are not just lofty human ambitions, but they're God-given dreams. Because therein lies truly our well-being, right with God, right with ourselves, right with men. In Romans chapter 8, verse 5 and 6, we read this. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. Again, I know your needs. I know the challenges you go through. I know the different realities of life that sometimes there's an angst inside. There's a sense of this uneasiness and worry. What's going to happen to my kids? What's going to happen to my spouse? What's happening to my business? Oh, God knows all that. God says, yes, those are real things. But I'm going to be the source of that strength that you're looking for. And I will give you wisdom. And I will give you direction. In other words, use, I rephrase it. In other words, go to God first and not go to God as a last resort. Because so often to, 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 to solve our problems, we try ourselves and when we cannot, when we're in too deep a mess, then we say, God, help me. It should be the other way around. Well, I'm going to use just two examples to show you what, what the Bible says about dealing with issues like that. I'm going to look at a very familiar passage of Scripture from Exodus, but from a different perspective. I'm going to look at, look, look at the life of Moses. 
And from there, draw the truth, I believe, that God is the true source of the significance, security, and serenity that we are looking for. I take you to Exodus chapter 2, verse 11 to 12. One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at the hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people, and looking this way and that way and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and he hid it in the sand. Moses was facing an issue that was so very, very heartbreaking to him. And he was trying to find solutions to this bullying of his people. And Moses began to take things into his own hands. And I say, earthbound ambitions and strategies without godly wisdom can only bring about disaster. Even here, I think there are different things which I'd like to just draw your attention to. Moses grew up in Pharaoh's daughter's household. He had some kind of, as it were, significance. But when he saw his people being pushed down and ill-treated by the Egyptians, I think he must have said to himself, now is the time to be hero, man. I must do something about it. Friends, it is I say this with caution. I think Christians should be activists. We should speak out against injustice. We should react against oppression. But we should never do it emotionally. But we should do it with godly wisdom and be God-directed even in the manner in which we choose to speak out against that which is unjust. But Moses reacted emotionally when he saw this. When he saw it, he immediately thought, I'm going to do something. I don't know whether he was looking for significance. But surely he was looking for security because immediately after he killed this Egyptian, he ran away to hide because he knew his own life was in danger. And he, he lost all peace since from that time forward. And he became a stranger in the land of Midian, becoming a shepherd instead. In the quest to do something great, Moses got himself into trouble. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 7 to 10, while Moses was in the desert looking after the sheep, he noticed that there was a burning bush that did not burn up. And you know that story. It begins with God calling out the name of Moses, going, Moses, Moses. I read somewhere that when you hear God call your voice once, it's already something that is, of course, very, very encouraging. But when he calls your name twice, he's got something for you to do. Moses, Moses, Samuel, Samuel, Saul, Saul. Moses heard God say, take off your shoes for this is holy ground. And then God says to Moses, the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of the slave drivers. I'm concerned about their suffering. I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land of flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I've seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. God was saying to Moses, Moses, you know what? You remember those years ago? When you heard and you saw and you were moved by the plight of the, the Hebrew, your, Hebrews, your people, Moses, I already knew. I already knew what they were going through, Moses. But 
I have a plan. Moses, you were ahead of me. There was not the right time for those things to take place, for that kind of rescue effort. But Moses, know what kind of a God I am. I am a God who sees all, knows all, and then I am moved by what I see, and in my perfect timing, in my perfect timing, I will do what needs to be done. God knows our, our, our need to be rescued. Some of you are trapped in relationships. Some of you feel enslaved in relationships in the office or at home. Or you've gotten into an abusive relationship and you're saying, how am I going to get out of it? I pray the Lord will take you out of it. So God began by revealing himself to Moses. I say the beginning to wellness in all our lives begins with an encounter with God. And I'm so blessed to be in a church where the worship helps us encounter God, where the messages help us encounter God. See, an encounter with God settles the issue of significance. Why do I say that? In Exodus chapter, Exodus chapter 3, verse 11 to 12, Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought these people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. And Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And this is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. My dear brothers and sisters, I can't think of anything that has given significance to my life more than my relationship with God. No amount of education, no amount of worldly pursuits, no amount of human achievements can ever compare with the fact that God knows me in that while I was still a sinner, Jesus Christ died for me. And every single one of you, I think more than about 1,000, 3,004 of you this morning, somewhere down the road, God said to you, I love you. And you responded by asking Jesus Christ into your, into your life. You know, friends, I'm often reminded it is not so much whom I know that is important. It is who knows me that is important. All so often we, we hear different people make statements like, I was at this dinner when so-and-so was there and such-and-such such was there. I happened to be at this, this gathering of businessmen and you know what? Uh, um, some, well, I just say Bill Gates was seated at the next table. Wow, I never thought I'll ever be, have the privilege of sitting at the table next to Bill Gates, no. While you are thinking like that and telling your friend, are you so chun, uh, sitting next to Bill Gates? Suddenly, Bill Gates turns to you and says, Hi, the people at this table have just been talking about you. What has that significant moment done for you? It pales in comparison to you saying, I was in the same room with Bill Gates, no. And to be able to say, Bill Gates knows my name. I'd like to suggest to you today, friends, you're not just in the same room as God is. God knows your name. God knows your name. God knows who you are. 
God is mindful of who you are. That's why when Moses wanted to go and do things on his own to try to rescue his people or to bring about a solution to a whole set of problems and tried to do it on his own, he failed. And then he had to learn this, that if you're going to go really be any kind of an impact in your ministry, in your, your life, know that God knows you. Because when Moses said, who am I? God didn't give him a long history on how Moses came to be. God just said, I am with you. Our significance comes from the fact that we are a friend of God. God knows us. God is with us. And God continues to reveal himself to us. Secondly, an encounter with God settles the issue of security. Moses answered, what if they do not believe me or, or listen to me and say the Lord did not appear to you? Then the Lord said to him, what's that in your hand? A staff, he replied. And the Lord said, throw it on the ground. And Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake and he ran from it. Then God said to him, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out and took the snake and it turned back into a staff in his hand. This said the Lord is so that they may believe the Lord your God they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has appeared to you. You're looking for security? Significance? God is with you. Security? His presence is an active presence. Your presence is an open door, we just say. Here in the presence of God, you can be reminded and you must be reminded of three things, these three things. Number one, God's presence is an active presence. My grandmother used to have this, this not-so-nice Cantonese statement. All right? I, I remember it. Suddenly, I remembered it just, just recently. She used to like to say to, to people who were of little use to her, I thought she had like a block of wood. God's presence is never a block of wood. It's never moktao. Where God is present, something happens. And that's our security. His presence is an active presence. His presence is a protective presence. And thank God, most of all, His presence is a transformative presence. Malaysia has had one transformative plan after another, one economic transformation, one education transformation, one after another. Now it's digital transformation. But I tell you, unless we are transformed by God, we will eternally have one transformational plan after another plan. Same thing with our individual lives as well. My significance comes from the fact that God's with me. My security comes from the fact that He's not just with me, but His presence is an active, transformative one. An encounter with God settles this whole business of peace and well-being. See, Moses, even though he had heard from God that God was with him or whatever, our friend still felt no peace. Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. I've never been eloquent neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I'm slow of speech and tongue. And the Lord said to him, who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, says the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and I will teach you what to say. In other words, God was saying to Moses, Moses, you say you're not significant, I told you. Moses, you say you're not secure, I told you. Now what, Moses. No peace for God. And God says, Moses, can you learn one big lesson or not? I am sovereign God. You don't have to identify what problems you have. I'm already greater than all your problems, Moses. I created you. If I was God, I would have just sent down fire from heaven and made Moses some big giant shish kebab. But God was patient enough with Moses. And so God just said, at the end of it all, you want this, you want that, you want that. Let me just finish by saying to you, I am your all in all. 
I'm not limited by your anxieties. I'm not limited by your abilities. I'm not limited by your understanding. I'm greater than all that. I'm your cornerstone. I'm your cornerstone. Conclusion. I just want to read you three passages from Romans in concluding and then make some, a few closing remarks. You know, the same thought is carried by Paul in the New Testament in his letter to the Romans. Our significance as believers comes because we're reconciled to God by Jesus and so His presence is with, is with us. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be, met, might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. In other words, this evening, this morning, you are all very significant to God. Like I said, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Our security, man, what a security. Because we are indwelt and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 9 to 11 says, You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of God, they do not belong to Christ. And if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. Can we grasp that? While this, I think, also refers to the final resurrection, can you grasp the fact that the same Spirit who raised Jesus Christ from the dead is the same Spirit who lives in you today? That's why Paul says, we are hard pressed all, from all directions, but we'll never be crushed because we are earthen vessels with treasure inside. And the treasure is the Spirit of God Himself. Last scripture from Romans. Our serenity as believers comes because He makes all things work out for good. All things don't work out for good. The devil will make all things happen to you. Friends, don't misquote this scripture. It doesn't say all things work out for good because the reason why all things happen is often because of my stupidity and because the devil wants to break my relationship with God. It's because there's animosity from some silly friends of mine or some colleagues of mine or some bosses of mine who want to break me. But whatever happens to me, God makes those things work out for my good. Because so often we think to ourselves, all things work for good. No, they don't work for good. Some things are to destroy you. But I thank God, God makes all things work out for good. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. Then we go straight to 28 Then we know that in all things, in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him. Those who are called according to His purpose. We are more than conquerors to Him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Last week, as we were celebrating Children's Day, as I was watching all the kids and watching all the proud parents and listening to Sister Petrina's great exaltation for us to talk about God from one generation to the other, I was convinced once again that parents need to be reminded 
that no amount of tuition classes, ballet lessons, swimming coaching, tennis coaching, will ever bring significant security or guarantees bring security, significance or serenity into the lives of your kids. If you really want to invest in your kids, that they will have secure lives. Lives where they will find meaning and a sense of wholeness. Would you please sow into their spiritual lives? Would you please make sure that the relationship that you have in the home is one that exemplifies God? And will you constantly speak of the goodness of God to them? You know, as well as I do, that children learn by example and by imitation. That modeling is something that they will always assimilate into their lives and their psyches. How you react in a difficult situation shows to them what your relationship with God is like. Parents, I ask of you, I beg of you. If you want kids who are going to be kids who will grow up with a sense of security, kids who will, when you are long gone, pass on to your grandchildren. Same understanding that all is well because the God of my father, the God of your grandfather, and your God is a faithful, good God who will always look after you. That the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for me, the God of my grandfather, has looked after me all through my life. While I don't have kids of my own, I've tried to inculcate this into every kid in Calvary Church that I've come in contact with. You find God, you have everything. You don't have God, they'll come to a point where your human understanding will fail you. Human provision will fail. Human wisdom will fail. Human forgiveness will fail. But God's grace, God's wisdom, God's love will never fail. For some of you here also, you may be like me. There's some areas in your life where you're really looking for answers. You need wisdom. You yourself are feeling quite empty because some things are not going right. Be reminded today that the Lord is here and He's more than sufficient for you. Is there a sense of need in your heart either for yourself, your spouse, your children, you're, you're trying your level best to do the best for them. And doing your level best to find answers to things which are going on in your own life. And sometimes you're so tempted to go your own way because business colleagues advise you to do this. Friends tell you that's the way they've dealt with their children. That's the way they deal with their spouses. I'm not putting down human advice because sometimes there's good truth in them. But ultimately, friends, ultimately, we need the mind of Jesus Christ and the touch of Jesus Christ and the leading of the Holy Spirit to be able to bring any kind of long-term answer to what we are going through or our kids are going through. 
I don't know what the Lord has said to you today but He is enough for that situation you're going through right now if you have a financial need He is the provision if you have a need for healing He is the healer much as He has given wisdom to doctors and the medical fraternity if you're looking for a healing in a relationship He is the great reconciler through the Holy Spirit yes go for counseling because that is important too but He is the ultimate are you feeling terribly condemned because of something that you've done wrong I thank God that in Him I can leave the past behind and press forward to what lies ahead because He is faithful to forgive those who have sinned. If you are here today and you just need the touch of the Lord in some area in your life, would you just quietly lift your hands wherever you are? Just lift your hands and say, Oh God, I need you. I'm seeing hundreds of hands going up all over the place. Just do that, won't you? Say, God, I hear you. I hear you, Lord. Lord, there are areas in my life which I really can't understand and I can't handle, Lord. But today I am just once again confessing that. Pastor Chris and worship team are going to sing this song once again. And you know, friends, there is no better place than to be found at the altars confessing that in my heart I believe, Lord. With my mouth I confess, Lord. And now I walk towards, Father, the place where I know has been set aside as a meeting place for you. And I want you to touch me. And I want to once again say to you, I trust you. So as we sing Cornerstone once again, whether you're in the last row or you are in the front row, I want to pray with you. Will you quickly come? And don't worry about whether anybody else is coming or not because it's you who's saying, I'm here to meet the Lord. Father, we invite you into our life. We invite you into that situation. Holy Spirit, we ask that you do what needs to be done and give us the strength to do what we need to do, Lord. We want Jesus to be glorified in that situation. So, Father, may your presence give us that boldness and may the Spirit work in us right now. Lord, we speak to that situation in the name of Jesus. We come to that situation and say we will not be overwhelmed because the Lord is my helper. For he who comes to the Lord will never be cast away. For the Lord will say to you, come to the waters and drink of me. For that which I give to you will be waters so that you will never thirst again. I say to you, receive my Holy Spirit. For did I not say to you that out of your bellies, the deepest part of you will flow living water that will not just quench your thirst, but will quench the thirst of those that you reach out to. The Lord would say to you, open up your lives for the new flowing of the Holy Spirit into your life. Hallelujah.